just wanted to take some time to, you know, I spoke to, to Pastor Cindy on what she would have me focus on. And she just wanted me to talk a little bit about my life and what I've been going through since the passing of my parents, but not only since then, before they passed and what, how that transcends to leadership. And so I thought it would be very easy to do that because having lived out the books that my dad have written, you have no idea. He has written books that he has been an example of. And he has written books that my brother and I are now living. And so when I say I have so much to give to you based on what I've experienced since his death, it's almost as though my life started November 10th of 2014, which is the day after he passed. And so, you know, she was, uh, Pastor Cindy was talking to me and she said, you know, she's so astonished and amazed at my age. It's interesting how we have put limits on leadership. It's disappointing that we have put leadership in a box. Leadership, age determines nothing. Gender determines nothing. It doesn't matter how young you old you are, it doesn't matter how old you are, God can use you and God will use you. It doesn't matter if you're a man, it doesn't matter if you're a woman. The fact that he created you, he created you for a purpose and to lead in your area of gifting. So when you look at me, if you want to really get practical with age, I'm 34. I am older than the age Jesus was when he finished his assignment on earth. So that alone tells you, I'm already too old. Jesus was 30 when he started, when he began, when he discovered his work on this earth. And it took him three years to complete it. If you notice, they didn't kill him. They didn't crucify him. He finished. And he was 33. So some of you have actually taken a long time to start. At 34, I should have been started a long time ago. My dad, by the time my dad was my age, he was married, already had my brother and, my, and, and, and myself, and had already been in ministry for 10 years, when he was my age. So who said you had to be a certain age to be a leader? Who said you had to be a man to be a leader? These are the societal stipulations that we have put on ourselves. We have placed ourselves in a box. But it's time for us to get out of that box. Boom, where is he? He said something earlier. He said it's time for us to rise, to rise up. And I totally, totally agree. Because my, you know, I had a whole, and I'm just going to totally forget about my presentation. Because... I had a whole life planned out for me, written down on what I was going to do uh, before everything happened, what my life was going to look, look like in five years, what I was going to accomplish. We were going to supposed to do that together as a group, me, my mom, my dad, my brother. We had a family plan for 10 years, 15 years, three years, five years. And we sat down and had that meeting a couple months before in 2014. And that was just my dad. Sit down, talk to us about the plans he wanted, got our suggestions, we wrote, we wrote it down, we were good. I mean, four, four strong hold rope we had created. Had this plan, I knew what I wanted to do, I knew what I wanted to be. I was fine being at the background, at the foundation, making sure that he could stand up on his two feet and do what he was supposed to do. Make sure that he had, didn't have to worry about books and didn't have to worry about CDs, didn't have to worry about what he was going to drink when he came off stage, didn't have to worry about his PowerPoint, didn't have to worry about the business aspect. That was my brother and I job. I had no problem not being in the forefront. Then November 9th happened and I lost the two most important persons to me. They were my strength. They were my pillar, they were my parents, they were my friends, they were my confidants, they were everything to me. So imagine having this plan, this life plan that consists of you and three other folks, and two of them are gone, literally just like that. Unexpected, you had no idea, no clue. 
Then all of a sudden, they're not only people who just live average lives. No. They have this big vision that they laid out, this legacy that they created, and you're now left to make a decision. Notice I said, I was left to make a decision. That book called Becoming a Leader means you have to make a decision to become the leader that you are. So you could decide that you're not going to. So the November 10th, keep in mind, they just died 24 hours before. 24 hours later, my brother and I were already in a position where we had to make a decision. Are you guys gonna come out of this hotel room and stand before the people and look strong so that they know that you are okay and you're not falling apart and you can actually do this? Or are you gonna say, no, I can't, don't bother me, leave me alone, I just wanna go under a rock, I just lost my parents, can I cry, can I grieve, leave me alone. And immediately, we had to grow up. Overnight, I had to grow up. At 31, I had to grow up. I had to mature. And we're not talking about from an age standpoint. We're talking about from a leadership standpoint, from a kingdom citizen standpoint, from when I was a child, I spake like a child and act like a child and thought like a child standpoint, to now that I'm all grown up, I don't do childish things anymore. I don't make frivolous decisions anymore. That was the, the, the decision that I had to make. And because of the foundation that my brother and I already had, my parents had laid one, we now, I don't, I don't think we had a choice. I tell people that all, all the time. I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice to say no. My choices were not yes and no. My choices were yes, are you gonna do it now? Or yes, are you gonna do it later? But it was never no. We chose yes, we'll do it now not knowing what in the world we were getting ourselves into. Had no idea what that was gonna look like, had no idea the pressures we were gonna go through, had no idea the people we were going to loss, had no idea the people we were going to gain, had no idea what that cost. Because leadership comes with a sacrifice. Leadership comes with responsibility that I didn't have 24 hours before. That was my mom, that was my dad. That's what they did. The forefront was their stage. This platform was their platform. It wasn't mine. So we made this, we, we made this decision, and it continues to be a struggle because I'm now having to be strong for myself and you and everybody else, but still try and grieve the fact that I've lost literally 75% of my life and what that looks like. As days went on, as time has gone on, I realized something. The one thing that my dad always said that sticks with me is purpose breeds life. And he always said in his teachings, the fact that you are still breathing today means that there is still a purpose that you are supposed to fulfill. If you were done, or if there wasn't anything else left for you to do, there would be no reason for you to be still here. God doesn't work that way. So I had to be okay with understanding and believing that my dad did not die in a plane crash. He just finished. And now it was our time. And when I say our, I'm talking about myself, I'm talking about you, and every other person that he's touched around the world. It was now, and it is now, our time to rise up. And it's now our time to lead. But for as long as he was here, that wasn't gonna happen. Because I was always gonna say, that's daddy's job. I was always gonna say, he could do that better than me. I was always gonna say, I can't do it like him. And then God had to do what he does best. Show up and show off. And that is exactly what he did. Now he did that at what I call the expense of my comfort. Because I was comfortable with my parents. I was comfortable being behind the scenes. I was comfortable being at the bottom, holding my parents up. I was comfortable 
just kind of not having to make decisions and having and and having very little responsibility i was comfortable but now that i am totally uncomfortable standing before you sweating underneath my black suit it is now that since november 9th of 2014 to now august what are we 19th of 2017 i have grown Discomfort produces growth because you're going to always be looking to get comfortable again. And you're going to always have to figure out what that looks like. So you're going to always have to change and shift and grow and figure out how I'm going to fit in here. And so you could never grow in comfortability. I wasn't growing where I was for three years, working with my parents. I was learning, yes. I was being trained, yes. God was preparing me, yes. But I wasn't growing because I was comfortable. As leaders, we cannot be comfortable. The minute we are comfortable, we are no longer leading. The minute we are comfortable in our position, we need to actually get up out of dodge. Because that means we have overextended our stay. And it's now time for us to pass that position on to someone else that can now make that position grow. You can't do it anymore. So I always say something that surprises me, but I think my dad, as much as he said as leaders, we must always be preparing our exit. And not necessarily preparing our exit of death, but preparing our exit of, I can move aside and watch my student, my mentee, my trainee, my prodigy do the work while I just sit and enjoy the fruit of my labor. My dad would have never done that. Not because he didn't want to and he was enjoying all the glory and the fame, but because for some odd reason, the more he did his purpose, the more his purpose grew. It's like his purpose exponentially grew. And so he never really completed it. And so I really do have some questions to ask God when I see him. Was he truly finished? Or were you really just trying to utilize everybody else that you had on earth that you know needed to complete their purpose, but they were not going to do it because they were saying Miles Monroe got it. And so God had to move him so he could move us. So there are so many leaders that need to be doing the same thing. But before, my, but be, before God moved him, my dad started planning his exit from the beginning of his time. So the pastors and leaders and followers that have been with him for 30 plus years from the, from the beginning are still there today. And they are the ones actually leading his empire and leading his legacy, including my brother and I. And it is safe. It's not someone who is just now new to the scene, never been trained by him, never been mentored by him. It is people who have been here. How many of you are so scared to die because you don't know what's going to happen to your business? No, seriously. I would like to know how many of you are so scared to die tomorrow because you don't know what's going to happen to your church. You are afraid that if you were to go today or tomorrow, your church is going to crumble. My dad always said, the greatest mark of a leader or the greatest act of leadership is that it's determined by what happens after you die. Not while you're doing it. Not while you're here. Because here, we could put on a good show. Here, I can dress up and look good all the time. Pastor Cindy could always look just as beautiful as she looked every day, all day. But if she dies tomorrow, and Sydney, Cindy, no, but Cindy M. International, if that dies with her, then she is actually failed as a leader. So it is my determination. I always told my dad, and I always told congregations when I spoke before he came up, I said my desire is to be greater than him. I want to be like him. 
So I'm not trying to be up here filling his shoes. I can never do that. But my desire is to be greater than him. And my dad was such a humble person. He wanted that for me. He wanted that for you. He wanted that for Charlie. He wanted that for Cindy. He wanted that for each and every one of you. That's why he poured himself into you. That's why he made himself reachable and approachable because he knew that for you to be greater than me, then I gotta be just like you. We are equal, I'm no better than you. You have so many leaders today who don't want to, they so want that glory. They so want that fame. They want everything to be about me. They want to always have the applause and the affirmation of their followers and those looking. Because God forbid they have to move aside and allow their student and their mentee to do that and they get that glory. Or they want to see them there and then watch them fail. And then say, I told you, you wasn't ready. So it is so important that as leaders in whatever area, whether it's a pastor, whether you have a company, an organization, a church, no matter what area of gifting you are serving in as your leadership, make sure that you are training and mentoring other people. And I say other people and not young people because it doesn't have to always be someone young. The people that are actually in, 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 in leadership now with my dad's ministry are actually people that were older than him. They're not, they're not people that were, you, were, younger and, were younger than him. And that means that your circle of mentees or trainees or students don't have to always be people younger than you. It just needs to be someone that's going to buy into your vision. That goes to show how important, how important and clear is your vision for your life, for your ministry, for your company, that anyone, young, old, are going to buy into it and they're going to follow. I'm assuming that most of you are here because of Pastor Cindy. Yes? She's did five decades. I just had a woman that's six decades come up. Then I had someone that's just one decade. So she have a whole array. That's good for her. That's a good indication of her leadership at this point. Now if she, something was to happen, I want to know where these people are going to be. And are you really going to still be buying into her vision? My brother and I bought into my dad's vision to the point where transforming followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change have now become our vision. Now the execution of that at this point may be different because I may have a different leadership style, style than my dad or we are now in a totally different era. So the things that we may do, like you saw from our foundation, my dad hadn't done any of those things. But in honor of him, in honor of his legacy, in honor of his life, in honor of the work that they had started and their love for people, we wanted to continue that because we have bought into their vision because we've seen it work. My dad always said, do not, your legacy should not be in buildings, but in people. So if you look, if you look around, you won't see my dad's name in any building. But you would hear people talking about it all the time. You know Miles Monroe, Miles Monroe this, Miles Monroe that, he going to the Bahamas. I mean, everywhere I go, I hear his name. Everywhere I go, that is what you should want. And he is in, he's no longer here. And we hear his name all the time, all the time. That is what I want. He doesn't need a tombstone. That is what we should want as leaders. But we got to carve that. We got to become that. We have to build that. And, you know, I was doing, a, I said a prayer today at a meeting I was doing this morning because I found it so important that we pray for our leaders. And I'm talking from the president Prime Minister, straight down. It is important that we pray for them and not slander. We pray for them and not bash. We pray for them and not be against them. Because at the end of the day, they are our leaders. And God has them there for a reason. So we're not fighting their leadership. We're fighting their spirit. We're fighting that spirit of ignorance. And God can do anything at any time. He can use any one of us 
to speak to Zuma at the right time and say the right thing and just cause a total change. But we got to believe that. We got to believe that. That means that we cannot live in the present. We have to hope. As leaders, we have to have faith. I tell you, when I say yes to the baton and yes to the legacy, I have to do it on two things, faith and strength. And it's not any strength of mine. I tell you absolutely no lie. Because if it was on my strength, I could not make it. I would not make it without my parents. So it's been a strength of God that came out of nowhere. And I say out of nowhere, but clearly it's been with me. For as long as I've been with him, the strength has been there. And he has been keeping me abreast. And I have to have faith that he is not going to embarrass me. He's not going to embarrass himself. And he's showing or use me to embarrass him. So I know if he's going to use me, it's going to use me to glorify and exalt his name. Because I'm going to say God said. I'm going to say God did. So he knows that he can't embarrass himself. But God is just waiting for the right person to say yes. And he's going to have you stumble over Zuma's feet and just say one word to him. And we can have a new South Africa. But we got to believe that we have that power as leaders. We have to believe that we know exactly and have exactly what it takes to make that change. It starts with us. And how many of you actually believe that that's you? You have the power. You have the authority. But you just got to say yes. Because it was almost as though as soon as I said, reluctantly, but I said yes. That was when God, I said, but I said, God, I'm not ready. He said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. I have been preparing you for the last 30 plus years. My dad was preparing us for the last 30 plus years, and I had no idea. I don't even think he had any idea. But he understood the concept and principle of training his children. And so... My brother and I, I'll stand on stage, and I would just say, God, just use me. Empty me, fill me, use me. And I would say things, and I'm, after I'm done, I'm going to sit down there, and I'm going to like, oh, Lord, what did I say? Am I going to end up on the news? Where did that come from? I always ask myself, where did that come from? Because somewhere in the back of my mind, I had been trained on that before. But it was such a time as this that it needed to come out. I read in his word in some devotion, some point in my life, because dad said, you must read your Bible and tucked away a scripture. And then all of a sudden, I needed it for day. The problem is, some of us don't have nothing to say because we're not studying and we're not reading. We're not being trained because we believe we have arrived. I was so happy to hear Pastor Cindy say, and I'm younger than her, but it's not about age. She's sitting there probably learning from me, but I'm learning from her because, like she said, we, we, don't know, we don't ever know anything and everything. As leaders, you have never arrived. You should always be in the classroom. My dad, as much books as he has written, he has read much more. And he was always reading. I hate reading. He was always reading, always reading, to the point where I'm always reading. Because I always wondered how, why, when, where did he learn this stuff? But he applied himself. So we have to make sure that we are preparing ourselves. And then there's this process that God has had me in since 2014 to now. And it's been very difficult. It's been very hard. It's been very challenging. But it's been very rewarding because I've seen the growth. And I've seen the maturity in the process. And I talk about process because process and purpose go together. Purpose is not fulfilled overnight. You are not going to be ready for your purpose overnight. Before God is going to let you even fulfill that purpose, he needs to know that you are ready. Because he knows that once you discover your purpose, as soon as you discover your God-given purpose, he knows exactly what's going to happen. The devil is going to attack everything about you. 
So he needs to know that, okay, when my child discovers this, that she is ready from a character standpoint, from an integrity standpoint, from an honesty standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint. But for you to be ready, you got to go through a whole, you got to start here. And you got to go through this whole process because he knows that once you're there, you got to be ready. You got to be strong. The problem is no one likes this process. No one likes that feeling of going back and forth. No one likes that pain. No one likes the hurt. No one likes the grief. No one likes the, um, I, I was rich one day and now I'm poor. No one, no one likes that. No one likes, no one is following me. No one is, is listening to me. No one likes this process. No one likes to feel like no one is listening to them. No one wants to be told what to do. No one likes this. Not knowing that it's this that gets you ready for this point. So enjoy the process. Accept the process as you become a better leader. Because once you have gotten here, then God is going to take you to places that he knows he can trust you. Because he knows what he has pulled you through and he knows what he has pulled you out of. So he knows what you can handle. So when the Bible says he's not going to give you more than you can bear, the Lord knew that, I don't know why he figured that Sharissa could handle what happened two years ago. I don't know why he figured me. But he, all, he obviously knew that if he had given it to somebody else, they would not be living today. Then he also knew that I was ready and prepared for this news that I was going to get. And then I was ready and prepared for what was going to come down the pipe afterwards. I don't know why he thought I was ready, because he didn't give me any forewarning. I wish he did. But he thought I was ready. And it turns out that some way, shape, or form, he was right. And I'm now coming into that belief. That wasn't always the case. And I have to be honest with you, because I want you to see that as leaders, we all have a down moment. As leaders, we ain't always on top all the time. My dad wasn't always on top all the time. People was always talking about him. And I always say, if they did it to Jesus, who are you? If they did it to him, who am I? And so I'm now understanding and believing that the process is so important. And I must go through it. I must go through this pain. I must go through the wind. I must soar. I must soar through the wind. And so what I've been doing is I've been using the wind and enjoying the ride. So when you saw that eagle that, sin, that Pastor Cindy talked about, eagles, and it's interesting how they fly, because if you notice, not very often do you see them doing this a lot. Chickens do that. Birds do that. Working every day, all day, and ain't going nowhere. Flopping, flopping, flopping. Ain't moving. Ain't just ain't going nowhere. The wind coming, they're doing this. The wind coming, they're doing this. But you see eagles, they actually just do this. And they let the wind glide them. That's what you call a storm. That's what you call riding a storm. And so I've had to ride this storm for the last two years. And it's been a storm, and it continues to be a storm. But I've allowed it to take me places like South Africa. I've allowed it to bring me to meetings like this so that I can tell my story, so that I can expose and experience and express the lessons I've learned because it has changed my life. And I'm no better and I'm no different than you. The only difference between me and you is I've been through some things. We have the same struggle. I have just been through some things. In order for you to start on this stage, I've heard some people ask me, you know, everybody wants to, everybody wants a spotlight though. Everybody wants to be able to stand on stage and make some money and talk about whatever, and sell some books and so forth. But nobody wants to go through the process that Pastor Cindy would have gone through or that I want to go through. Nobody wants to go through that sacrifice. To stand here, you have to lose two parents on the same day that have been your life for 30 years. Can you do that and still be smiling and still hold back tears? 
to stand where I'm standing, you have to watch your life crumble before your eyes and then pick it up on your own and put pieces together while still trying to smile and be strong for everybody else. That's a sacrifice. Leadership requires sacrifice. Leadership is also very lonely. If you notice with that eagle, who was he with? He was by himself. But one thing my dad always said, leadership was, is very lonely. You are going to notice very quickly, as soon as you start, start moving into your area of gifting and you start doing things, you're going to lose a whole lot of friends. You're going to lose a whole lot of people. Because they can't handle the altitude of the air that you're about to get to. So you got to be okay with saying, really? I really thought you was with me, but okay. And just shake him off. You got to be okay with flying alone for a while. Because I can assure you, he got some egos where he going. But he got to get there. And so we have to make sure that we are okay with sacrificing whatever it is, whomever it is, we have to sacrifice and become the leaders that we are. And now that we, because I know we're at that point where we're all ready to say, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to ride. I'm ready to soar. How do I do that? Spoon, I love his name, said the best word. Then we just need to act. We need to get up and start moving. Problem is we're not doing that. We're waiting for someone to tell us what to do. No, as leaders, you should know what to do. You know what to do already. You're scared to make that first step. Because making that first step means making it alone. But that's all God wants is for you to make that first step. I promise you, you make that first step and he has the rest. But he just needs you to make that first step of faith. Take faith and replace it. Replace, replace fear with faith. And allow him to take the rest of your steps with you, but you've got to take the first step as the leaders that you are. Yes? Amen? Amen. And I know that, um, that Cindy and I are going to do a question and answer session, but, you know... <laughs> Everyone always asks me, what is it like being the daughter of Miles Monroe? You know, someone so famous with all this information and knowledge. And the difference between me and you is he was my dad before he was anything else. I grew up calling him daddy. He was in Miles Monroe. He wasn't anything else. He was my mayor father. He was, he was, he was my mayor father. And he was a honest and true dad. Then when I got older to understand the length and the vast and the wealth of his information and, and, and knowledge, I started respecting him as a man. And I started respecting him as a leader. So now there was a differentiation between the leader and the mentor and daddy. But he was always both to me. And so I don't, you know, I don't have that big epiphany where it's like, oh my gosh, my dad is miles away. He's my daddy. Like, God is my daddy. Like, God is your dad. He is my dad. He was my source. He was my everything. And so you could imagine the grief I go through that I have to hide all the time because I've lost my everything. I've lost my dad. I've lost my leader. I've lost my mentor. But it was the best relationship that I can have for the foundation that I have. And that is what if I could express and expose that foundational knowledge and principles to you on a daily basis, I would, because it is so important. My dad had so much information, and because I've lived with him, I'm a little ahead of the game. And I don't want to keep all that to myself. I actually want to share that, because I want you to be just as I want us to be better than him. And my dad was great. Do we agree? There's no reason why we can't be greater than him. And that's what he wanted. And so myself, Charlie, stand up for me, please. Eric, stand up for me. We are all literally direct 
sons and daughters of my dad who have walked and talked with him while he was on this earth. And we want to be able to express to you and talk with you on a level that a son would talk to his father or a brother and sister on what that relationship and life was from a mentoring standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, from a succession standpoint. So we are making ourselves available for you on Wednesday to have that exact conversation. We want to have it as though my dad was right there and we want to give you the ins and outs on what it was to be with him, to follow him, to have a relationship with him from a father, son, father, daughter relationship. Because we, we, we want you to get the same information and knowledge that we got. Because that's, each of us have a different life since we've met him, since we've known him. Eric has a story. Charlie has a story. How his life has been completely turned around since he met my dad and following him. So we want to be able to express that to you on Wednesday, 6.30. I think registration is 5, 5.50. Um, with dinner included. And we just want to literally sit down and chat, have you ask questions. And we want to talk about coaching. We want to talk about leadership and succession. And what's that, what, what that looks like having being under the tutelage of Miles Monroe. Okay, so if you're interested, there's information at the book table. We will also be available to um, answer any questions you have as well. And we would love, I would love to be able to just talk with you and let you know what that, what that really was, being the daughter and student of Dr. Miles Monroe. Amen? Thank you, Pastor Cindy.